Okay, <clears throat> so um, last time we spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about uh, points of view in dynamical systems theory. And I introduced what I called Newton's point of view, which is basically, you know, start from ordinary differential equations, solve them, and then uh, present the result as a value versus time. Then I, then I spoke about Poincaré's point of view, which is uh, where the states, state space methods uh, got created from. Um, and that point of view shifts to understanding of how a variety of observables interact with each other in state space. <clears throat> and then spoke as well briefly about Wiener's point of view. I, I call it Wiener's, as I said, we could go all the way back to Fourier to understand the, the spectral point of view where um, the, the basic concepts are, let's say, uh, harmonic functions and their amplitudes, phases, and, and frequencies act as encoders of information. So you can extract back the whole information. Um, plenty of use of that point of view in, in, in control theory, in particular linear control theory. Uh, as we go through this class, you will see that some of what the Koopman operator theory provides is an extension of these ideas in spectral understanding to both transient problems and also you know, an expansion of the ideas of transfer functions from control theory to, um, uh, to, to, to fully nonlinear systems. So th that might be um, kind of an interesting consequence of, of the approach. And we started with the Koopman operator approach, which I pointed out last time, I think that encompasses elements of all three of these in various, in various ways. So you, you can go back to state space once we learn enough about the Koopman operator approach and understand geometry from that perspective. And my own, um, my own initial engagement with, with this theory was really from that perspective, trying to understand how we could find invariant sets, even in the systems that don't have nice invariants like energy or angular momentum or you know linear momentum. So uh, my own search for geometric objects led me to consider an operator theoretic approach um, in, in order to really find geometry. And that's going to be an interplay throughout, throughout this class. So what we're going to do today is we'll talk about Koopman eigenfunctions. So they are special observables that have, uh, that are characterized by having a, a, a special time evolution. They're going to talk about their algebraic properties. Last time I mentioned that the Koopman operator theory in many cases is a finite theory in the sense that yes, it's an infinite dimensional operator like we discussed last time, but you can often get a lot of uh, um, reduction in dimension that, that you need to consider by consider only a small finite set of uh, eigenfunctions. So we'll talk about algebraic properties. Those are the properties that are going to enable us to get infinity from, from finite, uh, finite considerations. And we'll introduce um, an object that's called the Koopman, Koopman generator. Now I mentioned this theory um, works even for systems that are not smooth, we'll talk about various classes of systems through the through the through the course of this. Um, but it's interesting to understand what happens when you try to apply it to smooth smooth observables and smooth systems because we have a lot of experience and a lot of results in state space theory uh, using these. So that that's kind of the plan for today. This this set over here. Let me go and review briefly the definition of the Koopman operator that we discussed uh, last time. So uh, we spoke about observables. Uh, we didn't say too much about what classes of those observables are. I'm going to start the discussion today, but any observable, in this case, vector valued, so you can think of 
cap of this bold phase G as having um, um, K components. So M is our uh, state space. And uh, we almost immediately ask that M be an object like a manifold embedded in a, a Euclidean space. Um, this is not a real restriction. Again, it's simpler to think uh, in, in those terms, just to kind of lock your understanding rather than uh, you know, start with M being a completely abstract set. But today we're going to, I think, end up speaking a bit about abstractions and why they're useful. <clears throat> um, so if, if you need to brush up on manifolds, as I said, I, I uh, wrote, I, I uh, put an appendix in that kind of is a crash course in differential, differential geometry. And then um, um, this G is going to denote a function, so a vector valued function or vector valued observable, we're gonna call it, um, from M to this K dimensional complex, complex space. And again, that's because some key concepts in Koopman operator theory like eigenfunctions end up being complex functions. And so it's, it's useful to start working in this space right away rather than working in real space and then saying, well, everything needs to be real. So we get complex functions and they're complex conjugates, the usual story that, that we tell. So let's just work in the, in the complex space and, and you'll see that uh, everything becomes uh, efficient and, 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 and simple. <clears throat> so there are two capital, two bold phase Gs here. One of them is G that is a function only of points in M. And you can think of that as just a static static function. So, you know, it's, it's a, a function defined on M. But then I have this label of G of T and X zero. What that's going to denote is what is the value of G that our, our system is seeing when starting from initial condition X zero at time t. And the way this is defined is that's a composition of G with a flow. So maybe I can draw a little bit uh, <clears throat> here. Say you start from some point and you end at this point over here. This is x zero. This is ST. X zero. And then G is a function that has a value anywhere on that trajectory that is evolving in our state in our set M. So now G takes you from any point in M, G, to, I'm gonna still draw something like a Euclidean space, but this is really the K dimensional complex space. It really should have, you know, an even number of dimensions here. So let's say four. Uh, so the idea is, that's a function. So for any point here on this set, you can evaluate that function. Now, G initially at X zero is that particular value. So that would be G of X zero. And then as you go in time, you find the value of G over here. That's the value of G. And the idea is that the G of T and X zero is the that value, that particular value, but ported back to X zero. So you see this G at time T at this point X zero is just the value that your system is observing as it tra traverses the set M uh, on, on the trajectory. And so therefore, what is happening here is that the values of G get ported backwards towards X zero. You can almost look at it as a wave 
of information that goes backwards from some point that the system is encountering to its initial conditions. I'm trying to give you a little bit of an intuition as to what dynamically the Koopman operator does on the space of functions. And I'll erase this and move forward. So that's what we talked about uh, last time. That was the definition in continuous time. And then <clears throat> if uh, we have a discrete time system where X prime now denotes the, the, va the, the point in M that is reached in one step of the dynamic evolution and T is a possibly nonlinear map that take us, takes us from X to X prime, then the Koopman operator is defined to again act on functions G vector valued function g of x by composition. And this is the first time we introduce the symbol for the composition, the circle here. And as I mentioned in mathematics literature, you will find the Koopman operator is called the composition operator really, most, most of the time in, in, in many, many books and, and papers. If you look for Koopman operator, you'll find it named composition operator because of, of this property. Now composition itself, that's the composition of an observable with the map. So first you start from X, you map one step forward, and then you look up the value of the function. That, you know, from this definition here, you can immediately see that that operator that takes G, a vector valued observable, and as associates UG, that's a new function. That new function is G composed with T, the value to the dex. So that maps vector valued functions to vector valued functions. And it's a linear operator because if you, if you, if you feed it two vector valued functions multiplied by some constants, they can be complex constants, then you find that the operator acting on that sum is really the sum of the actions of the operator multiplied by the appropriate constants. And that's, uh, and that's a linear operator. So that's where we, that's where we stopped the last time. And now- Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely, go ahead. Um, so if you scroll up, I think uh, to the page before, page 10, there was a bit on U tau of, of X zero. So like for a specific time, is that still an infinite dimensional operator or is that now a finite dimensional operator? No, what is infinite dimensional here is the operator itself for any fixed time t. Okay. So you should think of any fixed time, you know, for any fixed time, you get a mapping that is something like this, where prime now denotes the state that you have observed at time tau. Now, what is also infinite dimensional is the set of times that are labeling labels here. And so when you select just one of those, you reduce it to a one step operator. But as we are going to see today, that a family of operators, so it's, it's really a family of operators labeled by time, yes? That family of operators has some very special properties in particular under certain conditions on this flow here of the dynamical system. Let me just remind everybody that, that um, we started here from X dot is F of X, right? And then uh, ST was really the, the notation for the position X at time T starting from X zero. So that's defined to be ST. So just a change in notation of X zero. Right, and I'm doing the under uh, underline 
for the bold phase quantities in, in, in the nodes. So this thing here is called the flow because for any x zero, it gives you another x, yeah? So it's really a map from your initial conditions, space of initial conditions to itself. And, uh, and this function of time and x zero is of course, a, if you plugged it into this equation here, that would be a solution of that equation. That's just a reminder that that's something that we define in, in 215. Now this T of course can be defined on the whole real line. And F, if F is Lifshitz continuous, then this has uniqueness and existence everywhere on our set M. And so, um, and so the, the family of maps comes from the, 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 the label T comes from this family of maps. For every time T, your initial condition is taken somewhere else, right? And so you have a non-countably infinite set of operators. But what is interesting, and that's why this is a, a, a good, very good question, is that there are some specifics on how the evolution proceeds that allow you again to, um, to kind of represent this without worrying that it's going to change and be a very different thing at every, every time. Again, there is a mapping between these that, that, uh, that simplifies, simplifies things. And that goes under the fact that this ends up being a group. We'll talk about that further. Does that okay, answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Good. All right. And this was a little bit of a refresher for, for, for everybody else as well. Is, so now, is there an interpretation there of, um, of the Koopman operator as almost adjoint to the, uh, to the flow? No, it's a different thing and it's really a lifting. Okay. It's not really, it's not really an adjoint. You, can, it, you wouldn't consider it as a dual. It's a mm -hmm. lifting of the dynamics of the flow itself, which only acts on observables that you were given that are summarized in the vector X. It's a lifting to any possible set of observables of that X. Another good clarifying question, right? Okay. We really call it a lifting because G can be, you know, in the dual, basically you're taking a set of dual quantities. And morally speaking, that set of dual quantities has the same dimension as the set of quantities you started from, yes? Mm -hmm. Like when you define dual vector bases and things of that sort. Here, you're taking something that's possibly finite dimensional, although there is of course a theory for infinite dimensional dynamical systems as well. We'll talk about it in, in, in some final lectures. Um, so you can do this for partial differential equations as well. But it really lifts from this small amount number or small amount of observables to a very, very large space. And then the trick is find good observables in that large space instead of your original ones. Does that clarify it? Yeah. yeah. A good, good clarifying question. And we'll go there right away. That's a basic, basically a great, uh, great prequel uh, to what uh, to what we are going to talk about quite a bit today. So so now, instead of X, we will be looking for some very special observables. Why they're special? We are going to define them. They're again, functions from your state space to set of complex functions, and they have a special evolution in time. So this UT acting on phi, such a function, evaluated at some point X zero, or in other words, the composition of phi with ST, as we just discussed, should be, or rather, we are looking for functions phi that have this property, that they evolve as e to the lambda t phi of x0. And lambda can be a complex number. So once again, right away, we asked for observables that are complex. And here, we are immediately utilizing that framework. And we are going to call such observables the eigenfunctions of the, the Koopman operator. And here we go back immediately to Adam's question. It says, hey, 
one happens when we have different T's, aren't those different operators? And you see that I talked about simplicity a, a little bit as a prequel. Here you see it almost right away. For any T, ut phi is just some function of time times phi itself. So if you look at this G that we defined, which is the evolution in time of an observable, that was a function of t and x zero. You didn't necessarily separate it in a function of t times a function of x zero, right? It was a composition. That composition is not necessarily a product of a function of time and function of x zero. But look at what happens for these special observables. In this case, you get that their time evolution, you could call it a phi of t and x zero. Let me write that. So you could call this a phi of t and x zero, right? There we go. That thing is a product of e to the lambda t and phi of x zero. So it's a product of time and space. So for any t, that's true, right? So you see that there is uniformity in this, in this family. We'll continue that story. But even more important than intuitively, this now starts looking like separation of variables, right? which you know and love from previous courses that you've had when you touched on some infinite dimensional problems like string vibrations or you know problems in fluids with, for example, Stokes flows. You, you could use separation of variables, problems in elasticity, linear problems in elasticity. You could use separation of variables. And that's why these eigenfunctions are special. And by the way, think of this as some matrix A and think of this as some constant beta. You get A phi is beta phi, and that's why we call phi's eigenfunctions. Now we are going to call lambda eigenvalues instead of calling e to the lambda t eigenvalues. But that's a convention. It's a convention that we use in linear systems a lot when you have a linear system, right? and you, so you have a linear system x dot is equal to ax. With the matrix A, the eigenvalues of A are the eigenvalues of the system, yes? That's what you call the eigenvalues of the system. Similar here, this lambda here, you will see, it turns out in linear systems is going to be precise. Some of them are going to be precise in the set of eigenvalues of A. That's why we call them eigenvalues. Although from this equation, you would say, well, isn't E to the lambda T an eigenvalue? So by convention, lambdas themselves are eigenvalues. All right, any questions there? Good. So, um, so the next point up is, okay, now we have a definition <clears throat> and we have, we have the definitions of both the operator and an eigenvalue. Eigenfunctions, let's consider a very, very simple example, stable dynamical system in one dimension, Z dot is minus lambda Z, Z is an element of R and lambda is bigger than zero. So Z is just a real number, a scalar. So let's write the flow. So starting from some z0, st is z0 e to the minus lambda t. So as I've said before, this is, if you plug this in, this solves the ordinary differential equation, right? It's the exponential solution to the ordinary differential equation. And now let my observable, so now we are switching point of view. So far, all of it is just simple systems, right? State space. Now let the observable phi of z be, be precisely z the state itself. Then let's use our definition of the Koopman operator. Then ut phi evaluated at some point z is phi of its argument. What is the argument? 
st of z, so that's z e to the minus lambda t, right? So that's the composition. This is by definition of the Koopman operator. We need to compose the function phi with the flow. Here is the flow that's inside. And that's z to the e minus lambda t because phi is just the identity function. So it takes the argument and it produces the argument as the output. So that's, since z is phi of z, that's e to the minus lambda t phi of z. So u t phi is e to the minus lambda t phi. Great. That's precisely what we required for the eigenfunction. So nicely, <clears throat> the state function itself, so considered not as a coordinate z, but as a function or observable, where if you, if, you if you take a point z on the real line and you measure what you got, you get back exactly the number z. That's an observable. That's an eigenfunction of the Koopman operator associated with minus lambda. Okay, so far so good. What is interesting is that this is valid much more generally. That's going to be when we start studying linear systems in this framework, uh, you will see that the eigenvalues for a linear system of a matrix A that I just showed you previously um, are actually eigenvalues of the coupon operator as well. But they're not the only eigenvalues of the coupon operator. So consider now, instead of phi of z is equal to z, phi of z is z to the power n, where n is either a positive or for that matter, positive integer, but I'll talk about negative integers and other types of numbers as well in a second. So then u t phi of z, let's repeat the calculation is phi of z e to the minus lambda t. That is z, so apply phi to its argument. Phi is z to the power n. So I need to take z to power n, e to the minus n a lambda t, right? Because the end power of this exponential here is just e to the minus n lambda t. That's e to the minus n lambda t phi of z. Great. I, well, depend, depending on how you look at it, but seems great because I found a bunch of eigenfunctions. They're all simple monomials in z. And every such function is an eigenfunction. You might scratch your head here and ask, well, why do I get so much more? Remember, I think Max asked that question, is it dual or is it, and I said, it's lifting. So remember, one of the goals here is going to be to understand the evolution of every possible variable or, or observable that I can think of. And even if you have a linear system here, you might have some nonlinear observable. You know, tange of, of Z could be an observable. How, how do you, from just knowing Z and knowing the action of the coupon operator, obtain the evolution for all time of that? What you will see is that I will need those additional eigenfunctions in order to represent those evolutions. So it is a little bit like string vibrations, right? Where not only the fundamental mode, but also all of these other modes of vibration need to be taken into account when you want to understand the motion of, for example, a string from an arbitrary initial condition. Yeah, that's a good analogy to keep to keep in mind. Um, uh, however, of course, what is interesting here is there is nothing like string vibration in here. These lambdas, lambda to power uh, n times lambda is a, is a real number. It's not some kind of a frequency. This system doesn't oscillate. It goes to a fixed point. And so what we're developing here is the theory where way beyond, you know, conservative systems like string vibration without friction, 
you can understand the dynamics in in some sense in the same way where you're looking for some basic quantities like lambda the eigen the eigenvalues let's say of the linear part and then you have you have harmonics they're not quite harmonics they're integer integer um, um, uh, multiples of your fundamental of your fundamental object lambda and using that into account you can represent very very complex evolutions and at this point you could say hey if i look at your proof here i really could have used any z to any power be it integer or real or i could have used a complex number here because you're allowing complex functions right phi of z in principle can be complex functions so <clears throat> it could have allowed any number here and computation is exactly the same so what does that mean because now suddenly i have this plethora of eigenfunctions i argued that monomials are simple eigenfunctions that that's a good thing and now i have a massive amount of eigenfunctions yes if you have these continuities in the function you want to represent if you have you know some it lives in some strange functional space and this is the i think the first time i'm mentioning this then yes you will need more to represent that that evolution but as long as your evolution has some nice smoothness properties as we will see these monomials are going to be are going to be enough and for for those of you that already work and understand data science you could start thinking about what we call in data science the hypothesis space right so which function space are you do you want to uh, does your system live in and you want to get the results for these are important considerations in koopman theory because koopman operator to start with is infinite dimensional so you do need to consider what kind of functions are you are you actually analyzing right just as is typical in data science this is not novelty to those of you that that have already studied this let me see i think i might have a chat question or something ah okay that was from that was from previous so i we already discussed that okay any questions here we found a lot of icon functions right away so not yet okay so it gets more interesting <clears throat> There is something you might have observed here. If I only knew that one eigenfunction is z, then I could square that eigenfunction and get another one. I could, you know, take a cube and get another one. Whatever eigenfunction I might multiply with another eigenfunction, I get another eigenfunction, right? Z to the j times z to the k, where j and k are positive integers, is z to the k plus j. That's a positive integer, and therefore I get an eigenfunction. So this works pretty generally. Now, of course, in general, you would have to, and, and we will next discuss what kind of functional space you work in. But let's let's proceed formally a little bit and say, let's suppose that we found an eigenfunction, phi lambda one, that is associated with eigenvalue lambda one. And then we found another eigenfunction that's associated with, with eigenvalue lambda two then the product of these two eigenfunctions is again an eigenfunction. Remember, if, if you don't specify the space, you're just dealing with all the observables. So I'm just asking for two functions, arbitrary. They can be smooth, non-smooth, I don't care. It, it, it turns out by this simple computation that if you apply the Koopman operator to the product of the two, because the operation of composition passes through the 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 composition of this product function with st is just the product of compositions if you think about it right so if you have two functions multiplied with each other and then you compose them with a with a map then that's equal to the product of the compositions and so this thing here by definition is coupon operator acting on phi lambda one and that's e lambda one t phi lambda one because phi lambda one is an eigenfunction associated with eigenvalue lambda one and phi lambda two composed with st is e to the lambda two t 
phi lambda two. Now, taking the properties of exponential into account, you get e to the lambda one plus lambda two t phi lambda one times phi lambda two. So that's the same product as here. And therefore this is the proof that the product of these two eigenfunctions is an eigenfunction, eigenfunction whose eigenvalue is lambda one plus lambda two using the convention that we, that we talked about before that we are call calling the eigenvalue this argument here in the exponential part of the argument in the exponential. So you get one eigenfunction, you get a massive number of them because you can just take powers of that eigenfunction and you get new, new eigenfunctions. And this should remind you of something immediately and that's Taylor expansions, right? So if you take x, x squared, x cubed, so you will see that as we go on, that the way we are going to get some spectral representations of evolutions of observable is precisely using something like Taylor, Taylor expansion. But the difference is Taylor expansions are always around some point. This is going to be global in the whole, in the whole state space. And that's, that's a big, that's a big uh, advantage. To the approach. All right. So uh, <clears throat> in discrete time, let's let's write this out as a as a, as a, a proposition. And now we are going to actually state this very formally because the, the previous one I said, okay, I'm not worrying about where my functions are in, what you know, what what properties my functions satisfy. Now I'm going to worry about you know, what properties the functions need to satisfy for in order for, for everything to be formally, formally correct. And, uh, and this calligraphic F is going to denote all complex valued functions on the space M or a subset of all complex valued functions on the space M that is a vector space that is closed under pointwise products of functions. In mathematics, we would you know, this indicates that I'm going for something that's called an algebra, not just a vector space, but also an algebra, right? In on the real line, you have summation that you can do, and then you have then you have a multiplication that you can do, and so you know that that ports to some more complex uh, mathematical uh, mathematical uh, settings. And then also, I'm going to require that the constant function is in that space of functions. So in, in um, ter terminology for this is that this F is what is called a commutative algebra. And then we prove that the set of eigenfunctions that I denoted here by this calligraphic E is what is called a monoid. A monoid is something like a group that doesn't have the property of that, 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 that uh, there is always an inverse. Um, so in other words, it does contain the identity element that's just going to be this constant function. It does, it does have the property of associativity. So if you multiply two of those eigenfunctions and then multiply the product with the third, that's the same as multiplying the first one with the product of the second and third. It's closeness. So when you multiply things, it stays in the same set. And then commutativity, a product of function is a commutative, commutative thing. In particular, if you have two eigenfunctions that are um, eigenfunctions of this now in discrete time operator U with eigenvalues beta one and beta two, then the product is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue beta one times beta two. My previous construction was in continuous time. So you got lambda one plus lambda two and I'm pointing this out just so that there is no confusion. Again, this is because of our convention. It is really e to the lambda one t times e to the lambda two t that plays, right? But because we are calling this part of the argument an eigenvalue, then it's, then it's the sum. In the discrete time, it's, it's the product. Okay, so the proof is simple. A, a function that is equal to one everywhere is always an eigenfunction. If you compose a constant eigenfunction with some map, it's still a constant. 
So a constant eigenfunction is always going to be an eigenfunction and we always attach it to the, to the functional space that we are working in. And that's also the identity element because if you multiply any function by a, 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 a constant which is equal to one, um, uh, that gives you back that function. Um, so now we assume that u phi one is beta one phi one. In other words, phi one is an eigenfunction associated with beta one. And phi two is an eigenfunction associated with beta two. And then put psi to be the product of the two by the same computation as I had before. Psi composed with t is phi one composed with t times phi two composed with t. This thing here by definition is Koopman operator u acting on phi one. This is Koopman operator u acting on phi two and u acting on phi one by the by assumption is beta one phi one. u acting on phi two is beta two phi two. So you get phi one times phi two, which is psi and therefore u psi is beta one beta two psi. In other words, psi is an eigenfunction of u with eigenvalue beta one beta two. So this is a nice structural property of coupon eigenfunctions in under some specific assumptions on the space. It's a vector space, which is closed under pointwise products of functions. And then the set of eigenfunctions is closed under products, meaning you take two eigenfunctions, take a product, make a product, it gives you a third eigenfunction. That's very a, a very nice property. So that's what I meant by saying, if you have a finite dimensional system, you find a finite number of eigenfunctions that gives you a lot of eigenfunctions. In particular, you know, a, a countably infinite number of them. Uh, and, and therefore you get these infinite representations from finite number of objects. So as I said, very often, very commonly, this search for spectral objects gives you the ability to go from the idea of lifting where you take a nonlinear system and you lift it to an operator that is linear but infinite dimensional and you hold your head and say well i've introduced a ton of complexity by, by doing this what am i doing these kinds of results tell you that not that that not much is lost and everything is gained because by finding n objects you know, you have an encoder for the full, for the full infinite dimensional representation. That is not valid for every system under the under the sun. And I, we in in this class we are going to systematically go through the systems for which this is valid. In particular, you will see that we are going to introduce the idea of the spectrum of the operator. Think eigenvalues of a matrix. Yeah, that's the spectrum of a matrix. Um, but in an infinite dimensional case, the spectrum can be quite complicated and it can continue co contain what is called a point part, which is like eigenvalues really. And then something that's called continuous part. We'll discuss that as, as we go. So, the, so, so for these systems with a continuous part, you have to work continuous spectrum. So not only eigenvalues, but something more, you will have to work harder. But you could say, Oh, but which spaces have, you know, functions have this property and you go to a relatively simple, relatively simple system that I'm going to present, present next and you see there's some trickiness still involved. But before we go there, let's just observe what was valid for our one dimensional problem. And that is remember Z to the N, if you knew Z was an eigenfunction then Z to the N was an eigenfunction. So here, the powers of eigenfunctions are eigenfunctions. That's a very simple corollary. But uh, um, as, as, as announced, a, for continuous time system, we have a very similar result. The only difference, is, as you go through this, you're going to see that, that pretty much all the assumptions are the same and the results are the same. The only difference is that the product has associated eigenvalues beta one plus beta two due to that convention that I have now mentioned uh, about 15 times. And I think, uh, I think hopefully everybody now is, uh, is not confused by, by why the difference between discrete time and continuous time. Uh, 
So let's now go to an example where, where uh, the assumptions of these theorems are not quite satisfied. And it's a relatively simple one. There are two reasons for introducing this. One to see that even though the assumptions are not satisfied, you get something very, very similar. So not much is lost. And the second one is that Z dot is lambda Z is kind of the simplest dissipative system, isn't it? Z dot is lambda Z with lambda negative. Everything goes, if you, if you go state space, everything goes to the fixed point zero when time goes to infinity. So asymptotically, this is a very simple system. It's linear, it's one dimensional. In discrete time <coughs> uh, and in continuous time, the systems that are non-dissipative, but very simple are rotations. And one dimensional rotation on a circle is just, if, if theta is, is element of what we are going to call S1, a circle with radius one. So uh, really it, the, the values of theta vary between zero and two pi then you can define dynamics of a simple rotation to be theta prime. This is the theta at the next time step is theta plus omega, where omega is some constant, right? So uh, if omega is between zero and two pi as well, then it's simply just jumping around, jumping around um, on a circle. So you start from some initial theta and your omega would take you over here, right? So this would be theta and this would be theta plus omega. Uh, so as you can see, you know, as you, as you go around, you're just translating on a circle with the same constant omega. So let's consider this system, this dynamical system in the Koopman framework. The Koopman operator, um, we are going to test it on harmonic functions. So our observables are allowed to be complex. So we're going to take complex, uh, complex exponentials e to the i k theta. Um, and so uh, k is element of z, so positive negative integers. So u acting on e to the i k theta is e to the i k theta prime, or rather this thing here is t of theta, right? Earlier, we denoted the mapping by T. So uh, U to the E I K theta. So that is a composition of this function with the map T of theta. So instead of theta, write T of theta here, but T of theta is theta prime, or in other words, theta plus omega. And then you get E to the I K omega, E to the I K theta from this. And that just means that u acting on e to the i k theta is some complex number times e to the i k theta. So e to the i k theta is an eigenfunction of the Koopman operator at the eigenvalue e to the i k omega. So you immediately observe now that these eigenvalues here, the ones that we got in z dot is lambda z were all on the real line. So for z dot is equal to lambda z, you had an eigenvalue lambda, then you had two lambda. And so on, right? These eigenvalues e to the i k omega, they're actually on a unit circle and for k is equal to zero, they are exactly at one, right? Exactly at one. And then you get e to the i omega e to the i two omega and so on. So they're on the unit circle. You will see when we study what is called measure preserving systems that that's always the case for, for Koopman operator. It, it, it's basically always the case when your dynamics is already settled. It's, it's already, all the transients have passed and you will see we will prove that in that case, the 
the eigenvalues of the Koopman operator on the unit circle, just like for this rotation, this, this simple rotation. So e to the ik theta are the eigenfunctions. Again, we found an infinity of them. And also we found uh, many from one, because if you just get e to the i theta and e to the i omega as the first pair, then their powers, k powers, are also the eigenvalue and the eigenfunction. So again, it seems a very similar story is developing. If omega is rational or rationally related to two pi, so it's two pi m over n, where m and n are some integers, then for k, <clears throat> for the k iterate of the dynamics being equal to j n, you get e to the i k omega is e to the i two pi. So omega is two pi m over n, two pi j because k is j times n, right? So two pi j m and that's equal to one. So after, so these eigenvalues are going to be a discrete set on a unit circle returning back to one. But if omega is not rationally related to two pi, meaning you cannot write it as two pi times m divided by n for some integers, then the set of eigenvalues is going to be actually dense. You can see the proof of that in the appendix on topology that I, I posted. So interesting, right? Uh, the distribution of eigenvalues of the Koopman operator can be quite complex. Although we have it analytically here, it looks very simple, but it fills a unit circle sometimes. You will see later on that these discrete times they're associated with periodic orbits. So trajectories in state space that, uh, or, or rather motions in state space that repeat. And uh, the, Irrational ones are associated with motion on tori that are then dense motions. We'll, we'll talk quite a bit more about that. In 215, we, we had a, a pretty detailed discussion, discussion of that. So please look back at those notes again. So everything seems beautiful, uh, except for one thing, and that is, uh, what is our space F? Remember, I, I, on the previous in the previous results, I asked for this space F, such that if you take two functions in F, then their product is in F as well. That's what I asked for to have these nice results, and it turns out that in this very very simple example, that actually is not necessarily the case. Um, so namely, the, the, the functions uh, that one might consider on, on the circle, this is S1, the uh, radius one circle, our function is what is called L2. So the space of all square integrable functions on the circle. Let me just erase this for a sec. And, uh, and those functions, just by standard Fourier analysis, we can expand. So f of theta can be written as, as a sum of some coefficients, fk e to the ik theta. So any function we can expand in terms of eigenfunctions of the Koopman operator associated with the rotation. This is how you could read this. And fk is the kth Fourier coefficient. But these spaces are such that if you have two functions like this, f and g, it doesn't necessarily hold that f times g is square integrable. So two square integrable functions, you multiply them, they're not necessarily square. Uh, uh, the, the, the result is actually not necessarily square integrable. However, there is a saving grace. We found these eigenfunctions explicitly. And if you take any eigenfunction e to the i k theta, and multiply it with another one, e to the i j theta, the result is e to the i k plus j theta, right? 
And that's a perfectly happy square integrable function. It's a function of the same type. So what we found here, despite the fact that we didn't satisfy the assumption here, we found a subset of functions that is really an algebra. And those functions are actually the eigenfunctions and they span the same space, so that's the whole space. Namely, you can expand any function in terms of those. So happiness ensues, right? We, we still have the result, although it seemed precarious for a, for a second. And, and not as general, and not as general as we would have, as we, we would have wanted it. Okay, so that's the story about you know a little a, a, a beginning story of what functional spaces we we you know we need to consider when we are discussing uh, the coupon operator. And uh, as I as I already said, for those of you interested in data science, this is really a discussion on the hypothesis space. And there is still some uh, quite a bit of research going on in the Koopman setting, Koopman operator setting, as far as the as far as the functional space aspect aspect is concerned. All right. So here are some more uh, more interesting things about the the Koopman eigenfunctions. You would say, oh, if I have a smooth, this is now continuous time dynamical system. Let's say theta dot is sine theta. If you take a look at that system has, has equilibrium at zero and pi and everything between zero and pi goes to zero, everything between zero and minus pi, sorry, goes to pi, everything between zero and, and minus pi goes to minus pi. So this is the state space portrait of such a system. And it seems like a very innocuous system, but it's immediately uh, 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 comes, to, comes to four that there are some eigenfunctions here that are not smooth. How so? Take a function that is one between zero and pi and zero elsewhere. The function is one anywhere here and zero down here. Then if you start on any trajectory out here, what are you going to see as you go around? One, 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 right? No change. So that function, if you're down here, you're going to see zero, 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 zero. So no change. So that function is an invariant. In particular, for that function, and I have it actually written down here, the evolu Koopman operator acting on such a function, we are going to denote these indicator functions on sets. So a function that is one on a set and zero elsewhere is called an indicator function. You see it's discontinuous. It changes from one to zero, right, at this point. It's an eigenfunction because if you, if you take u to the ut and apply it to that function, you get back the same function. But it's discontinuous. So perfectly smooth system has discontinuous eigenfunctions, right? So clearly we need some setting in which this, this is accounted, accounted for and, uh, and, and understood. However, we are going to start with considering evolution of functions that are actually smooth to start with, because we can get some intuition, intuition out of it. So let's, let's do the following. Remember g of t and x was the evolution of an observable g over time under, under our system. The way, we, the way we obtain that, we start from some initial condition, evolve that initial condition for our time t, and then evaluate g at that, at that final condition, and we associate that with x, right? So this is what we denoted by g of t and x. So that's a function. I assumed it's smooth. So I can take, in, in particular, I can take a derivative or I can take a gradient of that function. We are on some Euclidean space. So perfectly happily, I can take a, a gradient operator. So let me take a partial derivative of G with respect to T to see how things change in time. By definition, G of T and X is just G composed with ST. Chain rule, first I take a gradient of G at stx and then i multiply that with the 
derivative of s dx with respect to t. The derivative of s dx, this is just the flow dynamical system with respect to t is the underlying vector. That's a, 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 a bit of geometrical theory of ordinary differential equations. Again, it was mentioned in, in my earlier class, but so ds dx dt is just the vector field. We're starting from vector field x dot is equal to f, right? So f evaluated at s dx is what we get. And then we get this graph g s dx. Now, the only tricky part here is to recognize that the vector field at some later, later time, when you start from position x, is precisely grad st, the gradient of your flow, multiplying the f, the vector field at the initial point. That's the only tricky part. That's a little bit of differential geometry. Please look up the appendix or any book on differential geometry with, with vector fields and flows, and you're going to find that particular, that particular formula. And now we have this grad G, grad ST. If you unwrap this, this is really just the grad of this function G of T and X dotted with F. And so I actually got a nice partial differential equation for this object G. Partial G with respect to T is grad G dotted with F. What is that? That's just the directional derivative of a function G in the direction of the vector field. That's how you can think about it. So that's, that's the evolution when your G is smooth. So you can take these derivatives, grab G, right? Um, and that's interesting because now I have represented this evolution of G in terms of a partial differential equation. So let's consider a simple dynamical system again on a circle. Now this is a rotation as well, but it's theta dot is omega, where theta is in S1 again. So this is just a smooth rotation. Things are just spinning around. And if any, uh, any of you are in neuroscience, very often we model the, the you know, phases in, in uh, this context using equations that are obviously much more complicated than this, but, um, but, but still in the, same, in the same framework on S1. So now, according to the previous discussion here, what is f of x? Well, f of x is just omega. It's the right-hand side of your equation. So you get partial g with respect to t is omega, that's f of x, partial g with respect to theta. That's your grad g, right? x here is just theta, so it's just a single variable. I'm taking a partial derivative. You've seen this before, I think. This is a one-dimensional wave equation. So the coupon evolution in this case, you can solve this. It's easy to solve. And the solution is g, any g, oh, that is differential with respect to theta, evaluated the theta plus omega t. So I told you before, so now our system here is just kind of spinning around the circle and you start from some theta and in order to find, you know, what the value of your observable at time t at this point theta is going to be, you go theta plus omega t so you go to some point that you evolve, you find your G at this point, you find your G here, and then you pull it back over there. And that's why sometimes um, the Koopman operator is also called the pullback operator. You see why, right? So you start from theta, you go to theta plus omega T, find your G, pull it back. G of theta plus uh, theta plus omega t. And again, this definition, this here evolution requires the G be smooth, but really at the Koopman level, you can write this equation 
without any respect for G being smooth, non-smooth, it can be an arbitrary function. And this is when you, def when you define the coupon operator to start with, you absolutely don't need to worry about the function space. Once you start talking about eigenfunctions and products of eigenfunctions, then you need to start worrying about whether things are closed and whether, whether you know, what kind of spectral expansions you're going to get and, and things of that sort. But to start with, the object is just what is called a, a, a pullback operator. And in some sense, you can kind of see how it acts now. It almost like, acts like a wave that is traveling backwards, right? So whatever value here you have, let's see, you know, that your G looks something like this. Those values are just going to be spinning backwards. That's your that's the evolution of coupon operator. So it's a wave equation, and that's that's how it that's how it um, that's how it behaves. Okay, so next time uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the relationship between um, between the equation that we just derived here and especially its right-hand side. And we're going to call this, this is going to be another operator for us um, uh, and call it, we'll call it the generator of the Koopman evolution. Uh, and we'll, we'll combine those ideas together to see how this is explicitly linked to the UT that I presented before. But at this point, we'll stop at this example and I'll see whether there are any, any, any questions here. All right, not for now. Let me know if there are any. In the meantime, uh, have a great few days off and then we'll see each other on Monday again. All right, see you, bye-bye. Bye. Um, professor?